Good evening. We will start now. It gives me great pleasure welcoming everyone to the first of the Open Health Systems Colloquium, the first uh, talk of the series. It is a collaboration between Open Health Systems Laboratory and the India International Center. And uh, it uh, seeks to bring together thought leaders to present and discuss issues of life sciences in an effort to promote inno innovative and holistic thinking. A series of four colloquiums has been planned for 2019. Everyone here is familiar with the India International Center. The IIC has always been an oasis where free and frank debates over various issues has been encouraged, always. And the IIC has been promoting discussions and debates in the sciences, culture, the arts, economic, technological, and social issues, among others, that reach out to both national and international audiences. The Open Health Systems Laboratory, a social enterprise incorporated in California, was created out of uh, Anil Srivastava, Dr. Ken Butro, and Martin Doish's work with CA Big, that is a cancer biomedical information grid, about a decade ago, and to essentially further the goals of CA Big. It is therefore particularly special that Dr. Butro is here with us today. OHSL has teams located in the University of Maryland Biopark. Uh, in uh, the Silicon Valley, Cal uh, California, and in India. Now, uh, the Open Health Systems Laboratories was built with the idea of bringing expertise and knowledge from diverse fields, uh, institutions, and uh, countries together in order to address important challenges of life sciences through international, international collaborative or team, team science consortia, working in translational research mode. The principle of OHSL has been that the knowledge, that knowledge has the potential to contribute to the growth of science and to, <laughs> and to enlighten or empower people only if it is shared and not being restricted in silos. Over the years, the organization has been working with a number of leading biomedical scientists in India and abroad in the areas of biomedical sciences, social and developmental studies, information technology, in an integrated manner. Cancer is one of the key areas of focus of OHSL. Some of the examples of collaborations that OHSL is part of and has played a key role in building are the International Cancer Knowledge Alliance, the Indo-US Advanced Radiotherapy Consortium, the Ayurveda Developmental Therapeutics Program, the International Bacteriophage Research Consortium, and there are others being built as we speak. In this, we have been closely working with the Center for Development of Advanced Computing, CDAC, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the Tata Memorial Center, the Delhi University, Proletus Health Tech, and others. We are particularly happy that Dr. Bhatkar is here today, and uh, with his vast computational knowledge and his uh, knowledge in Ayurveda, he has been a guiding spirit for a lot of our work and our collaborations. At present, OHSL is working towards building an incubation platform in India where young researchers with ideas can come and uh, perhaps a support system can be built around them uh, with mentorship, infrastructure, and collaborations so that they can further their research goals. The, today's talk is the first of the Open Health Systems Colloquium series. We are privileged to have with us Professor Kenneth Butro, Professor of the School of Life Sciences and Director of the Computational Sciences and Informatics Program, Arizona State University, as our first speaker of the series. We are also privileged to have Dr. Vijay Bhatkar and Mr. Kiran Karnik with us on the panel. I'll just give a brief introduction to Dr. Bhatkar and Mr. Karnik, although most of you would know them. Uh, Dr. Vijay Bhatkar is one of the most acclaimed and internationally acknowledged scientists in India. He is best known as the architect of India's national initiative in supercomputing, where he led the development of India's first supercomputer param in 1990. Dr. Bhatkar is also widely known for bringing ICT to the masses through a wide range of path-breaking initiatives, such as the celebrated GIST multilingual technology covering India's 22 official languages with 10 diverse scripts that has dissolved the language barrier on computers. 
Dr. Bhatkar is today acclaimed as one of the top 25 pioneers who contributed to the development of India's uh, $100 uh, billion plus IT industry. Dr. Bhatkar has served as a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister, member of the Governing Council of CSIR, and a member of the IT Task Force cons uh, constituted by the Prime Minister in 1998. He has authored and edited over 20 books and 80 technical and research papers and addressed several university convocations. His current research interests are in supercomputing, artificial intelligence, brain, mind, consciousness, nanobio infocogno, the NBIC convergence, and synthesis of science and spirituality. Among his many awards, Dr. Bhatkar has been conferred with the Padma Bhushan, the Padma Shri, and the Maharashtra Bhushan Award. He is a recipient of the DataQuest Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Vijay Bhatkar has been the chairman and board of Board of Governor, Governors of IIT Delhi and is presently Chancellor of Nalanda University, Chief Mentor of Multiversity, Chancellor of D.Y. Patel University, and National President of Vigyan Bharati. He continues to contribute to India's national supercomputing mission of development of petascale and exascale supercomputers and their wide-ranging scientific and societal applications. He is also the chairman of the Oversight Committee of Science and Engineering Research Board, the SERB, an apex body of Government of India that supports basic research in emerging areas of science and engineering. He is the chairman of Unnat Bharat Abhyan, India's national initiative of connecting IITs and other leading academic institutions to villages of India. Mr. Kiran Karnik. Mr. Kiran Karnik describes himself as a public non-intellectual with interest and involvement in a range of public issues. In the course of a career of over four decades, he has had the unique experience of straddling the diverse spheres of government, business, and civil society with equal comfort and accomplishment. Among his many positions activities, he is the chair of Oxfam India and of HelpAge India, chairman of the Indraprastha Institute of Information Technology. He is also on the board of many institutions. He has been on many key government committees and has, been, he has also been the member of the uh, Scientific Advisory Council to the Prime Minister and of the National Innovative Innovation Council. Mr. Karnik was president of NASCOM, the premier uh, trade body and the chamber of commerce for the IT software and services industry in India, and has been instrumental in promoting India's technology strength to the world. Mr. Karnik has been founder director of the Consortium for Educational Communication, which was responsible for the countrywide classroom bo uh, broadcast and other ICT initiatives of India's University Grants uh, Commission. Earlier, Mr. Karnik worked for over 20 years at the Indian Space Research Organization. He was a key player in the pioneering India-USA satellite instructional TV experiment site and was deeply involved in the conceptualization and planning of the multipurpose INSAT system. Mr. Karnik has been conferred many awards and accolades, including the Padma Shri and also the DataQuest Lifetime Achievement Award. Mr. Karnik has been a prolific writer and has authored many books, the latest relevant in today's context being Evolution, Decoding India's Disruptive Tech Story. I would now like to invite Dr. Bhatkar, Mr. Kiran Karnik, and Professor Ken Buto to the dais and take the places. I would request Mr. Karnik to introduce Professor Buto and to chair the proceedings. Thank you, you Karninika. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to what promises to be an extremely interesting evening. Uh, pleasure to be here to listen to Dr. Buto. Uh, you already heard introductions which were 
somewhat long, so I'll make this very, very brief. Uh, Ken is very well known, and many of you in this field would already have seen and heard of his work. He's a human geneticist and in the works in the area of genomics. He's done some outstanding work. He's presently at the Arizona State University and heads a very important lab there that looks at complex systems. Uh, his work, interestingly, is looking at innovations and looking very, very importantly at what promises to be a very, very exciting field. And to me, what's particularly interesting is its relevance to us in India. He's doing a great deal of work on looking at how the newer elements of big data analytics, of data science, of artificial inter intelligence, what we in broadly in terms might call the IT-related parts of developing these areas is related and can be related to the whole area of biomedical research. And as I said, this is an area that holds great promise. Uh, there used to be some time back, many years ago, information about the excitement of bioinformatics. It didn't quite take off, but with the new developments that are taking place now, with the kind of data analysis that's possible now, with the computational power now available to us, with the data sets now available, the future looks very promising in this area. One of the things that Ken was mentioning to me as we were chatting is to look at the possibilities, and we see this all the time, that how data is being used by the commercial companies. If you look at the large data gatherers, you know, companies like Amazon or Google or WhatsApp, they mine a huge amount of data from you and I, they store it, they analyze it in all kinds of ways, and from being able to serve you just the right ad that would interest you, which is what Google does through AdWords, to moving on and involving psychologists and behavior scientists to be able to model behavior, and now somewhat scarily to be able to predict behavior. That's where these data sets are taking these people to. And so they will know almost before you do that you want to go and buy a particular product at a particular time from a particular shop and will have it right there popping in front of you. This is not science fiction. This is all beginning to slowly happen. And that slowly is becoming faster and faster. So can we apply some of these same techniques and abilities, in fact, take them further forward to begin to apply them in the area of biomedical research? I think this is the excitement that's something of special interest. And why I mentioned earlier that this is particularly relevant and important for India is because one of our special capabilities is, in fact, in the area of IT software. It's an area in which we've got a huge base of human talent, growing very rapidly. Excellent people who have done very, very good work. At the moment, our abilities in the cutting edge areas, like artificial intelligence, are there, but are limited. Thanks to people like Dr. Bhatkar, and something he started almost three decades back, CDAC, we have built up a tremendous capability in computation. Some of that in his days he translated into actual hardware. After that we may have gone a bit slower on that, but even now the exciting developments there. But irrespective of the hardware that comes out of those developments, the software that comes out, the ability to take and put together things for large scale computation at high speed are there. And this combination of elements of having huge amounts of data sets, which our country has no shortage of given our population, of having the capability through our software areas in a, being able to look at, analyze this, and of having the capability in the computer area for large data analysis at high speeds. A combination of these with or married to the needs that come from biomedical sciences, I think are something that looks very good. This is going to be a large part, as I understand, of what Dr. Buto is going to speak about. And I'm looking forward, as I'm sure you are, to a very exciting presentation from him on what is happening, where it is, and we might then look at what things it portends for us. Uh, at the end of his talk, we'll have some questions. And after that, I would request Dr. Bhatkar to pull it all together, to give us his sense of it, to sum it up, and very importantly, to give us some guidance for where we might go as a country from there on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and may I now invite 
Dr. Butor, come and make his presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm both humbled by the opportunity to be the kickoff speaker in this very important and exciting uh, forum that's being created by our colleagues at OHSL. Uh, and I'm flattered to have such a distinguished and uh, uh, outstanding audience as well as uh, panelists to be able to be part of this session as well. Uh, I'm gonna be talking today uh, uh, about similar to what was just said about the opportunities that come forward by looking and using today's state-of-the-art information technology, 21st century data science, uh, in the context of biomedicine. As this audience is, I'm sure, aware, India is in the midst of a dramatic shift of what disease looks like and what the disease burden that the country is facing. This shift actually is in many ways the product of a true success story where infectious disease, which used to be the primary cause of morbidity and mortality in India, is now in a radical decline and actually replacing it as the major causes of morbidity and mortality, and I apologize for the complexity of this slide, are now chronic diseases. Diseases such as heart disease or COPD and cancer. The challenge that comes from these is that because they are chronic diseases, they put tremendous burdens on the health system. And while public health interventions that have been very successful in eliminating uh, the burden of infectious diseases, what we see is that there is no comparable in Western medicine or in any medicine reduction of the burden of these chronic diseases. These still plague the Western world as well, the developed world as well as the developing world. First among these that's representing a particularly important challenge is the expansion of the role of cancer as part of the disease morbidity portfolio. For instance, in India, we're projected to see 1.2 million new cancer cases a year. This is a 20% increase expected by 2020. Uh, and with, by the time we reach the next 10 or 15 years, that number of new cases is going to be about 1.7 million. That's substantially larger than the burden faced by most Western countries. Of equal importance, though, is that this burden of cancer actually represents a significant fraction of the total deaths that will be present in the Indian population. And of equal importance for a, com for a country that's in the midst of economic development, it actually also results in a dramatic, almost 5% cost to the workforce of total disability years and is doubled in the last 15 years. So what we see is actually this cancer burden is both growing, partially as a, not necessarily by new incidents, but the demographics of the population as the population in India no longer perishes to infectious diseases, as well as ages, what we're seeing is an increase in cancer. But what's also intriguing is we're not only seeing an increase in cancer as the total burden of health, but we're also seeing that the particular portfolio of cancers is changing as well. So the cancers we're seeing in 20, in this instance, 2016, are not the same cancers that were driving the public health agenda 15 years ago. So instead of cervical cancer, leukemia, and other cancers being at the top of the list, we now see stomach cancer still at the top, but breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, head and neck cancer, uh, and colon cancer. Now rapidly increasing in their incidence. And as you can look through, and I apologize for the small type, uh, blame the Lancet for this, uh, is that you can see that almost all of the cancers contribution to morbidity in India have increased by 100% or more in the last 15 years. And one I'll, pull, I'll pull, draw particular attention to that's of interest to me, and I hope will ultimately be of interest to you, is the very rapid increase in one particular form of cancer, liver cancer, which has increased by 200% in the last 15 years, arguably attributable to the advent of 
of obesity and diabetes. And there's a concern that to my children's generation, liver cancer will be to my children's generation what lung cancer is to my generation and my parents' generation. So not only do we have this rapid increase in the rate of cancer, we also see tremendous variability in the portfolio of cancer across the states of India, with 2.6 times variation depending on what state one is in. So we can see this pattern has not only dramatically increased with variability between the Indian states, but we can see actually the pattern that's emerged doesn't have a simple pattern that correlates, that it's not just high incident states became higher incident states, but we're seeing different patterns of cancer occurring in different states with limited knowledge of what the etiology is that's driving those different patterns of disease. Also provocatively, and unlike what's seen in the, uh, the developed world in the, and in the, the Western medicine, is what we're seeing is that cancer appears differently in India than it does in other Western countries. In particular, what we can see is cancer presents earlier in females than it does in males. And in particular, breast cancer appears at a much earlier age in Indian women than it does in Western women. Let's focus on just for a second that I think is an example of the challenges that are being faced uh, in the Indian oncology community. So focusing briefly on breast cancer, what we can see is the five-year breast cancer survival rate in India is about 50% lower than it is in the rest of the world uh, with a very different pattern of treatment uh, and actually a very different presentation. So the average age of diagnosis in India for breast cancer is in about 45 to 50 years of age, whereas in the West, the average age is 60 plus. We can see that the proportion of high-grade cancer, the most aggressive lethal forms of cancer is higher, substantially higher in India, uh, and have tumors that don't respond to the traditional treatments. What's particularly provocative is the breast cancer that's appearing in India can't be explained. More than 50% of it can't be explained by the known risk factors that we know drive cancer, breast cancer in particular, in the West. So over and above this then expansion of cancer in cancer risk, India faces a number of unique challenges in facing this new advent or near epidemic of cancer and chronic disease. First, the amount that is expended or available for expenditure in India is literally 100 times less. So when we see an average patient treated in the West at MD Anderson, one of our comprehensive cancer centers, the average per patient cost is approximately $100,000. Actually, I'll point out this number is dated because in 2013, this predated immunotherapy, which actually now has doubled the cost of delivering care for many different types of cancer. So on average at Tata Memorial, it's a fraction of the amount of money that's actually available for expenditure and support. So this places a tremendous financial burden on the system. We also see that it places a huge burden on the delivery of care. In particular, we can see what the actual total spending per capita in, for instance, India and China is per, uh, in comparison to the US. But I think more importantly, in terms of the burden it's putting on the health system is the number of physicians or the limitation of the number of physicians available to treat this class of disease. So for instance, in the United States, the per physician, uh, uh, physicians per 100,000 uh, 100, people is 242, whereas in India, it's 6.5. So the amount of burden this is going to place on the health system is actually almost insurmountable. Lastly, uh, in terms of actually this class of problem, is that India has a very non-uniform distribution of where this care is being delivered. 40% of India's uh, cancer ca centers are located in six cities. So while we have this vast geographic area that's actually experiencing cancer, the concentration of physicians is in a very small area. What's actually also occurring that's going to 
represent a challenge to India is the movement in the West toward personalized medicine. Uh, personalized medicine, for those who aren't familiar or given a general audience, is all about delivering specialized care to the right individual, the right care, the right time, and the right place. It's coming up with individually tailoring one's care so that it is uniquely characterized to the specific patient at hand. This is unequivocally a product of the genetic genomic revolution that results in the specification of the tumor-specific properties as well as now the advent of individual characteristics of patients. The problem is, even for Western medicine, this new personalized medicine portfolio puts a, a substantial challenge on the evidence generation infrastructure because ultimately, every cancer case becomes an individual cancer case. So we now have to look at N of one clinical trials and how do we then go about generating evidence to support the efficaciousness of any particular intervention or treatment when each individual patient is unique. So this is exemplified just if we look briefly at this chart. So we start here with non-small cell lung cancer. What we can see is since the original advent of cancer diagnostics of saying lung cancer at the turn of the century, we now have literally 34 different types of non-small cell, non cell lung cancer. This isn't unique to just lung cancer. We can see if we look at multiple myeloma, we now completely define the disease based on its genetic signature, and there are now more than a dozen different classifications for multiple myeloma. Similarly, breast cancer has seen a dramatic expansion of its molecular characterization. So now we no longer can just treat breast cancer, but we have to worry about all of the unique molecular signatures that are producing these different types of cancer. So why is that a challenge in this context? Well, in this precision medicine paradigm, we're going to be targeting these based on the molecular characteristics of the tumor and the unique genetic constitution of the population that's underpinning it. So why does that present a challenge for India? Well, for one reason, India is not well represented in the large-scale international registries and repositories that have been generating the molecular profiles for these diseases. In fact, most in the most comprehensive sets of these portfolios, for instance, the Thousand Genomes Project, the Indians that are represented in that were Indians that have migrated to Houston uh, and are a small number that you can measure on both hands without needing, both fin without needing all fingers. So, nowhere near capturing the diversity of the genetics of the Indian population and no guarantee then that the portfolio of interventions that are being developed in Europe or in the United States will actually have applicability at all to the Indian population because it's not clear that the genetic background, because we don't have information on this, will be the same for the Indian population as for the Western populations. Similarly, the context in which the disease is occurring. So we've already seen, for instance, that breast cancer appears to be different uh, in India. May that be due to different cultural practices, different dietary practices, different lifestyle practices. None of these are being inventoried as we generate the next generation of personalized medicine characteristics. So as, we, as the world moves toward personalized medicine, in the absence of concerted effort in the Indian community, there's a real danger that these chronic diseases like cancer will, not, will no longer fit to the Indian population without committed efforts to see what would actually drive them. So this is clearly a complex problem that actually has many, many challenges associated. But I would actually argue that Met, like many unique problems, what we need to do is address not actually what are the problems, but how can we innovatively address solutions to these activities. So, specifically, what I would actually argue is we need to look at the whole biomedical paradigm from first principles and actually figure out in our evidence generation demonstrating the efficacy of particular interventions and treatments what is it we're trying to accomplish rather than starting with the processes and businesses, 
business activities that we have in place and care delivery strategies, I'd say, how do we make what we're doing better? I think it's important for India, especially at this pivot point, to look and say, how can we address this problem from fundamental first principles and solve the problem in unique ways that will be customized and tailored to the Indian communities? So I would argue that what we need to do is start moving away from what was unequivocally a very successful 20th century research care paradigm, where we started with some basic discovery, did product development, translated into care, and then did outcomes and survival. The problem is this system had to be repeated for every intervention, for every different personal profile, for every individual circumstance. And it's simply, even in the West, with a hundredfold more expenditure of resource, doesn't scale. And in fact, even in the West, they are struggling with how are we going to do these next generation interventions. What I would argue we should replace this 20th century paradigm with is a 21st century paradigm, where we actually generate a learning health system, where we actually capture the information that's available in this system as to what works, what doesn't work, and mobilize that information on a routine basis so that each care delivery encounter actually informs the next care delivery encounter and actually perfects and informs the system in a manner that each interaction produces a better outcome. So what do we need to do to do this? Well, first we need to fundamentally address the idea of how do we get evidence in the biomedical enterprise. So evidence is key. We actually don't want to go back to old days of empirical medicine where we actually sort of make things up as we go. I think the transformation of the 20, 20th century medicine was to have it be objectively based with formal decisions made and characterizations of why and who things should be delivered to with probabilities of success. So evidence takes data, observations, and by understanding its relationships, converts this into information. This information then, when we look at its delivery in particular patterns and outcomes, actually generates evidence or knowledge. So what we need to do is capture this knowledge generating framework, but not necessarily using the tools that we used in 20th century uh, biomedical evidence generation. So how do we do it in 20th century evidence generation? Well, we use the gold standard for medical determination of efficacy, the randomized clinical trial. And, and again, I want to be really clear up front, I'm not arguing against the ongoing conduct of randomized clinical trials. But what you'll hear me say is that I think there are new ways to augment this framework with new information technology processes. So why do we use randomized controlled trials? Well, they're objective, they're unbiased, they're reproducible, and, and have demonstrable value. They demonstrate evidence in an objective way that actually is reproducible. Although I will argue, just in a side and in discussion, randomized clinical trials themselves have drifted away from their original principles and are actually oftentimes now conducted in such artificial circumstances that they can't be translated into the direct daily care patterns because they're conducted in instances where concomitant conditions are eliminated or particular demographics are not included. So their translatability is unclear. So what's important for us is to recognize is what is it by doing this in the randomized clinical trial that we get that's of value? Well, the essence of a randomized clinical trial is that it has specific criteria for inclusion, exclusion. It has a defined protocol. It has randomization to eliminate bias. And it's designed in a manner that allows us to have appropriate power to make specific objective observations. So there's nothing magical about a randomized controlled trial other than these characteristics. So what I'm going to do here is argue that we can achieve those same standards by using modern information technology uh, to objectively generate information in a manner used by our $4 trillion business colleagues uh, across the economy. Uh, and 
recognize that there's a new way of doing things. It doesn't mean that the old way is wrong, but there's new ways that allows us to address and have additional opportunities to generate evidence. And I recognize immediately that to my biomedical colleagues in the audience, this would be absolutely heretical to suggest that we might do something other than use randomized controlled trials as our driver of evidence generation. So what I propose, and actually not unique to me, many other people in the community are suggesting that we leverage data science uh, and the power of big data to now generate a next generation evidence base. Uh, this is not a new idea, uh, and in fact, uh, goes back a very long way. And the pioneering technology of this has emerged since actually even 100 years ago when uh, an entrepreneur uh, in the US, uh, John Wanamaker, uh, was actually trying to figure out how to spend or invest his advertising dollars. And in this, he actually wanted to come up with objective ways to evaluate how to spend his money. And this famous quote from, uh, from Wanamaker is, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half is being wasted. So predictive analytics have been delivered and created by large-scale, multi-billion dollar companies to ask and answer that question. So there's a whole new generation of machine learning tools and technology that allow companies to be able to now objectively create information that drives the capacity to be able to ask and answer questions in the framework of what should one do for particular advertising and where one should invest their advertising dollars. These machine learning processes include deep learning neural networks, principal component analysis, on and on. So I'm not going to spend the rest of the time talking about these algorithms per se, but I'm happy to anyone who is actually interested in these to talk about how they can be applied. But what I want to indicate is that literally $5 trillion in the world economy is driven by using these analytics. And I guess I would at least say metaphorically, if they didn't work, these companies would not be making five trillion dollars in their application. There's demonstrable evidence that you can make reliable, objective predictions using these machine learning and other classes of data science algorithms to come up with objective classifications to solve the Wanamaker problem. The problem is, though, right now, is that these problems are only being addressed in the context of the commercial arena. They're helping Amazon drive you to predict, predict which books you want to purchase. They're helping Google know which ad to present to you. Uh, and I think nobody says it better than uh, John Hammerbacher, who is actually one of the pioneers at Facebook, that actually tried to predict why certain groups would join or not join Facebook, is that the best minds of the current generation are learning how to make people click ads. And to him and to me, it seems like that seems like a shame. Shouldn't we be applying this same technology to figure out what drugs work in which individuals? What therapies are best suited for which people? How do different particular backgrounds influence uh, who's going to respond and not respond and help to even identify the next generation of interventions? And just as an aside, John Hammerbacher himself left Facebook and now works at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, actually trying to bring these technologies to bear in helping, health, in helping the healthcare delivery system. So I think our challenge then is how do we translate these big data clicks approaches to biomedical questions? How do we apply these to be uh, identifying under given clinical demographic and lifestyle characterizations what does, how does survival differ among alternative interventions and put that at the fingertips of physicians uh, making clinical decisions. So what we need to do is recognize that we can do things in addition to the randomized clinical trials approach to solving problems and actually bring these new data science approaches in to complement those results by recognizing that p-values may not necessarily be defined in advance, but are defined in a, tr a, tr in a test set against an algorithm that's been trained against a large set of data. 
uh, and the commoditization of evidence generation so that it's not done in this custom randomized clinical trial framework, but is essentially part of the data collection framework. That as we, each observation comes into the system, then further refines and reforms our algorithms to give better and better predictions and to discriminate who should receive what in what circumstances to achieve the personalized medicine paradigm. So what do we need to do this? It sounds uh, pretty elegant. Uh, the prerequisite is we need lots of data. So big data, kind of duh, requires big data. Uh, now we hear a lot about big data. Uh, but what we find actually is in biomedicine, while for instance, genome sequences has a big data footprint, we actually don't systematically have data of the magnitude that the Googles or the Facebooks or others have, where we have literally millions to tens of millions of observations. Although we're starting to be in the process of doing that through electronic health records, large scale image repositories, registries, clinical research, repositories, patient reported outcomes, and large-scale genomics characterizations. So the US arguably was a pioneer in this space of generating electronic health records, at least in the modern setting. Uh, and in fact, undertook specific efforts to see to it that the electronic infrastructures were put in place to automate the collection of information. Uh, with the tune of actually about 15 years ago, uh, spending tens of billions of dollars to put in place these electronic health records. They used a system called incentives requiring meaningful use, where basically physicians were encouraged to adopt these systems based on reimbursement that was coming through the federal government, uh, but was required to have each of these records were, were required to be able to support particular types of functionality, but very little beyond this particular sets of functionality. What's emerged now 15 years later is the recognition that these EHRs now in place are placing very high administrative burdens and driving healthcare spending. For instance, the US spent $38 billion requiring doctors to put in these systems using meaningful use, but unfortunately, these systems are really the dread of most of the physicians. Actually, to a person who I talked to who is actually delivering care in the United States, the least least uh, rewarding piece of their work is the time they now spend literally acting as data clerks, entering data into these systems. Not only do they dread using them, but over and above these early incentives for adoption, we now actually find that there are huge fiscal costs to continue their maintenance. Somehow, oftentimes as much as $25,000 per month per physician practice to keep these records in place and up to date. I think we can actually, uh, using a phrase uh, coined by my teenage daughters, uh, this would by any demonstrable uh, uh, characterization be described as an epic fail. So why did this fail so miserably? Well, arguably, one of the reasons it failed is that the implementation of these records was done not with the physician in mind, but essentially putting in place electronic systems that had been created for billing purposes. So they didn't consider medical workflow, didn't consider the information doctors would want in having an electronic health record, and in fact, oftentimes enforced rigid implementation of guidelines. From an IT pers person's perspective, one of the challenges that emerged in this was they didn't require standards uh, and each individual installation, if you saw one electronic health record installation, you saw one electronic health record instantiation. So as such, there was no inter-hospital connectivity, no interoperability, and each instantiation was custom. So all we did is take the worst of what IT does is took an existing process, made it electronic, without any consideration of how it should or could be used to improve the care. So what I would argue, and a piece of advice from an American that's been there, is don't go there, okay? So if you're going to go about instantiating electronic con connectivity in India, consider upfront the concept of data liquidity. So that's sort of a cool sounding word. What do I mean by data liquidity? 
Well, data liquidity means rapid, seamless, secure exchange of useful standards-based information among authorized individuals and institutional senders and recipients. So that's kind of a loaded definition, but it basically means that we need to design into the system from, from the get-go, first principles, how the data can be connected with other data across institutions so that the whole can be more than the sum of the parts. So that it's not just this individual physician's observations, but the entire ecosystem of physician's observations can be collected. So we need to actually bring together diverse information from the clinical setting. We need to be bringing in information from other modes of care delivery, such as pathology, uh, as well as now the next generation of molecular characterizations and make sure that all these different pieces of information can connect and inform each other in an integrated seamless system for the delivery of precision personalized medicine. So this requires not just the instantiation of an EHR at one location, but the recognition that we need to have an entire ecosystem of care deliverers all be able to be interconnected and exchanging appropriately authorized and de-identified information so that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Moreover, what we need to recognize is this not only needs to include the care delivery and research environments in our academic universe, but also needs to bring in all of the stakeholders, uh, not only just uh, the specific hospitals and or research institutions, but needs to include both industry and consumers, needs to be connectable to the IT industry, as well as then needs to be able to support a whole pro proliferation and plethora of outside end users. So let me walk through this sort of simplistic in a more granular fashion. So first, we not just need to put in EHRs, we need to create smart EHRs. EHRs that actually the physician gets value by interacting with the system, that actually helps inform the physician and actually helps them know how their previous patients have fared with particular interventions and treatments. These EHRs need to be engineered so that they support clinical research, uh, both the randomized clinical trial framework that I mentioned a moment ago, but as well need to also be able to support this new big data aggregations that we can use to use the tools that are used in other industries to generate evidence. These then need to be able to be aggregated into these patient outcome frameworks that then allow the physicians to be able to guide care by providing clinical decision supports tools, comparisons with other patients with similar characteristics, as well as then being able to bring in this new generation of precision medicine information. It needs to be put in the hands of consumers so that they can make intelligent decisions about when and how to engage with their physicians. And of course, that needs to also be saved by the system of the healthcare system itself so that there can be process improvement, cost reductions, and appropriate prioritization of what things need to be delivered to who, when, where, and what. So these patient outcomes, and actually, ironically, uh, the most of the electronic health records in the US don't actually capture the outcome of patients. They only capture the interventions that were performed. You have to go to completely separate data resources to find out what actually happened to the patient in your care. If we combine all these different collections through this data liquidity framework, we then create a cancer knowledge cloud. This cloud then facilitates the capacity to support next generation research, uh, and also then allows the outcomes of that research to then be filled back and, and fed back and help support additional investigations and support the decision making being made uh, in the day-to-day -day clinics. So through this, we create a virtuous cycle where EHRs, and re uh, EHRs support research and research then supports clinical care and generate a learning healthcare system. So India is well positioned to actually implement this today. India has world-class information technology capabilities necessary to realize this vision. And because it doesn't have legacy infrastructure that has to be remade, can implement the infrastructure from day one, leveraging the experience that other countries and other communities have found. So 
in place in India are key resources. We've heard already a bit about CDAC. We have the national knowledge network in place, and as has already been shared, India leads the world in many ways in its IT contribution. Uh, and in fact, a significant fraction of India's GDP is based on the unique capabilities that India brings in the IT community. So you have the tools, you have the technology, and you have the capabilities. Let me walk through quickly. Uh, I mentioned CDAC. CDAC itself is actually generating a next generation health informatic electronic health record. It's in charge in some sense of the standards. Uh, and if working with physicians has the ability to generate these smart EHRs and could help distribute them worldwide. Over and above this, CDAC actually has extended expertise over and above the clinical sector in doing these large-scale machine learning and cognitive system frameworks and is on the bleeding, leading edge of, of uh, digital biology and in molecular medicine. India has already put in place a national knowledge network. It has in place the backbone necessary to move the data uh, from location to location, although still struggles with the last mile projects of how one connects an individual hospital to this background network. India has world-class biomedical capabilities, whether it be the All India Institutes of Medical Sciences, our colleagues at Tata Memorial Center, or elsewhere, uh, has the best and the brightest, uh, and has capabilities in medical care delivery uh, second to none in the world. And moreover, India has already put in place uh, in uh, certainly through uh, one particular effort, the National Cancer Grid, but other emerging networks of physicians. So, all of the constituent parts are in place, commercial IT capabilities, uh, government funded uh, guidance and rule making groups that could facilitate the administration of frameworks. We have in place the capacity to have the interconnectivity necessary and the medical communities already in place. What's missing though now is the critical mass of bringing these together in an integrated alliance. So what we are suggesting could be next, the next transformational piece would be take all of these individual pieces and through a series of developing activities, bring the community together to realize this promise. So a cancer knowledge alliance. The goal of this alliance is nothing short of having state-of-the-art cancer knowledge that informs all biomedical clinical care and research, having a whole framework where we leverage 21st century information technology to bring together these disparate parts of the community. So the Alliance will join together the community, build and support the facilitation of sharing of knowledge. It will provide the tools to analyze the information and ensure consumer privacy is protected, which is a critical component. Uh, the goals are nothing short of improved patient care. Physicians can customize the patient treatment based on comparing what is known in these large-scale resources. Uh, delivery of care to places where it actually not as easily accessible today and actually have system-wide comparative effectiveness uh, and patient empowerment that will increase both research productivity uh, as well as accelerate the development of new therapeutics. So right now, uh, our colleagues at OHSL are convening a community that actually helps support this activity. So as I've already been introduced, OHSL actually is a, a program, it's an international network of cancer treatment activities uh, and, uh, excuse me, biomedical activities. Uh, it operates as a nonprofit organization that is a social benefit core, and we've heard uh, that it actually has an international presence. It has multiple academic partners that I won't go through since much of this has already been discussed in the introductory comments, but actually represents uh, IT and academics throughout the world. Uh, and the problem then that this group is trying to solve is how do we bring together these disparate parts, uh, create the framework where the data can be integrated and have liquidity, uh, and then facilitate its use in care delivery as well as in direct generation of next uh, generation of the next generation therapeutics. So 
in this instance, the idea is to actually start to bring together components of this community to act now, uh, think big, start small, act now to produce this next generation framework. So in this instance, we will use next generation information technology to make the Cancer Knowledge Alliance possible. So one of the key efforts that's being developed right now, uh, we have members in the audience who are members of this uh, activity, are trying to create a smart clinical information system that actually once implemented could be used nationwide. The idea is to actually capture each patient encounter in a digestible way that then prevents, provides proactive intelligent database that learns from each encounter and allows there to be evidence-based treatment, not necessarily from the evidence generated from a randomized clinical trial, but from the actual practical tactical implementation of care that's seen in every clinic across India. So then these evidence-based guidelines then provide real-time statistical analysis that learn from each individual group. And partners are already working on this in the area of neuro-oncology and in other areas. There's also then prototypic efforts to share and explore how appropriately de-identified information could be distributed through a commercial commodity cloud computing infrastructure. So for instance, in this inst partnership with Microsoft and its Azure uh, cloud infrastructure that would then permit the construction of data lakes that could be shared uh, with appropriate access and authorization. We're also exploring how one can bring together next generation tools to support the analysis of this data. In particular, one of the key areas that OHL has been, OHSL has been involved with is in how to actually interpret uh, imaging information using next generation algorithms that actually extract features, computer-based algorithms that extract features uh, that actually can support then the radiologists and others who would normally be interpreting these images in an objective fashion, reducing the burden of reading and facilitating then the limited resource of, of skilled image analysis uh, experts to be able to then be augmented with these computer-based systems uh, by analyzing in vivo imaging. And again, in this instance, best practices that have been designed uh, through international collaborations that are developed through the National Cancer Institute then can be delivered and wrapped and packaged and then dis distributed and shared anywhere in the Indian uh, care delivery environment using, using state-of-the-art information technology capabilities. Uh, OHHL is also then working with how to create and catalog the diverse collections of information that would be part of this ecosystem. In partnership with the commercial group Unify, we're working on how we could create the indexing necessary to access information so that its liquidity could be increased and could be brought on demand to ask and answer these clinical questions that would be necessary to drive the next generation 21st century medical paradigm. So what's the last and remaining critical steps that we need to worry about? Well, unequivocally, the key barrier in India, in the United States, or elsewhere is how do we address the issues of consent and privacy? Uh, because ultimately, we need to actually have infrastructure that supports and securely uh, controls the access to the data and gives confidence to both the medical practitioners and the patients that their data won't be misused. Uh, again, another emerging uh, information technology framework that supports this then is blockchain. And despite what you all might think, blockchain is not spelled B-I-T-C-O-I-N. Uh, in fact, blockchain actually is a technology that creates a secure and robust public, le public ledger uh, I, I'm actually struck when I go to the IIC and sign out everything and I see the big paper ledger books that I use, basically uh, that are ubiquitous in India. What we actually would do with blockchain is essentially create an electronic version of those ledgers that keep track of each transaction and through public key encryption then control who gets access to what information in what circumstances. So shown here is a cartoon where we would have traditional data resources, but what they would be done is protected by access by a blockchain 
public ledger infrastructure that then would allow patients and physicians to determine who gets access to what components in a robust, secure, reproducible framework that then protects access in a manner that blocks those from getting access to information that they should not and make sure the information is not corrupted, cheated, or hacked because of the robustness of the blockchain framework. So through the execution of electronic smart contracts, uh, this public key encryption then blocks much of the activity that hackers have been able to use to violate existing information systems and then allows this layer of security uh, and, uh, and transparency that's difficult to enforce and see in other custody and ledger class systems. So what we hope is by putting these kind of infrastructure in place, we can transform the medical enterprise to be able to use these big data frameworks to support decision support, provide access to the global knowledge of diagnostics and others in a manner that actually each patient encounter informs the delivery of care to the next patient through a secure model that actually has uses state-of-the-art technology, distribute and share information with low-cost models, unlike what have been implemented in the United States, and it can be a continuous learning system, both in terms of its content, but in the application of information technology. So what I would argue is we need to be bold. We need to actually be pioneers, and in fact, India has a unique opportunity to leapfrog what's in place in Western medicine by actually embracing next generation data science approaches for the purpose of knowledge generation that augments what we might be doing with randomized controlled trials, but facilitates then the leveraging of each patient and that no patient's suffering is ever in vain. And that in fact, each patient who is in the care system actually helps in some important way the next patient's care delivery. So with that, I will say that we're actively seeking collaborators and partners uh, and would welcome anyone who's interested in participating in this activity uh, and would like to join forces in, in this new revolutionary approach to delivering biomedical uh, research and care. So with that, I'll say thank you and I actually ask my colleagues to join me at the dais so that we can actually uh, have a discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ken, for that very wide-ranging and very exciting, as I anticipated, presentation. Uh, very full of material. I guess it will take us a little while to digest and get into a system. But I'm sure some of you have questions. And uh, we have, fortunately, some time for questions. And uh, I would request you to go ahead with your questions. And Ken, please stay there. <coughs> So uh, that was a fantastic talk. I, uh, I just wanted to ask a, a couple of doubts. Uh, so this, uh, this open health system which relies uh, a lot on the data analytics and uh, also you're mentioning the N of 1 trials. How, how do you anticipate to create a training set? And when would you uh, call how many numbers of N of 1 given the diversity, given the demographics in our country, uh, that would be, I think, one of the major challenges which we would face. And uh, what are the kind of uh, your thoughts in that uh, regard is what I would want to ask. So I think, first of all, you hit the nail on the head of the challenges associated with approaching these problems. So I think what one would do is similar to what's done in Google, even what's done in, uh, in these other large-scale machine learning frameworks is you accumulate data up to the point that you actually appropriately train a model uh, uh, and capture, in this instance, the diversity of components. Actually, a feature of these big data analytics 
is that they use the entire collection of the diversity of the information. Unlike a traditional randomized controlled trial where you actually try to discard all those variables, actually part of the machine learning frameworks is to bring as many of those variables in as discriminators as is practical and as possible to frame the first generation model, to train the first model. Uh, and actually, it's difficult to say in advance how big that data needs to be. Uh, in fact, machine learning frameworks have training cycles that, that reach the point where you see reproducible answers, and that's when you stop training. And that accumulate is a test set that normally is about 5 to 10% of the size of the original data set that you would need for validation before you actually delivered it. So a little bit depends on, on the diversity of the information and how focused you are to start. So if you start, for instance, uh, one of the places that we are exploring electronic, the smart electronic health records is in a relatively narrow slice of oncology and neuro-oncology. So you would start with a relatively well-defined problem but capture the diversity of the information and train the system until it gives reproducible results on that training set uh, through a variety of resampling and other procedures, and then proceed to collect an additional validation set based on the dynamics of that particular model. The models itself tell you actually how big you need uh, the data sets to be. Thank you. Yes, back there, please. Yeah, my name is Dr. Saljit Dudeya. Professor Ken, it is said that cancer being a lifestyle disease, the way you pointed out, there is an increment of 200% in some parts of India, particularly Punjab, Haryana, where chemicals and fertilizer are being used in large form because of green revolution. One district is suffering, whole district is suffering from cancer, particularly Batinda. And every week one train is going from Batinda to Jaipur for chemotherapy, that's called a cancer express. And same is for even towers, cell towers and radiation. These are causing our lot of health hazard cancer. Do you think that nowadays new technology from Russia called proton therapy is in available is effective except for leukemia? Because that can be create, cured in 60 days. That now in USA is also be very popular. Proton therapy. Thank you. So I think there's a whole range of new therapies that are coming on the line. I, and actually, I, I, I'm not a medical professional, so I hesitate to actually comment on the specifics of any sort of therapeutic in uh, therapeutic application. But I think what we're, the goal of this approach, though, would be to actually capture all of those different flavors of intervention and to be able to then systematically and objectively evaluate just what you're, the question you're asking is based on seeing these different collections of information, what's the most efficacious approach. Thank you. Oh, question. Yes, please. This side. He's getting a mic back. He's here, he's here. Behind you. Good evening. I'm Sham Chakrorty. Uh, it's, it's a very complex discussion, very complex thing. Um, some uh, high-level issues which comes to my mind that what cost involved and uh, in, say, for example, developing a big data analytics and everything, and what outcome we expect. Say, for example, <clears throat> outcome in terms of what? For example, in terms of life expectancy? So, what? so, so the cost actually depends a little bit on the model that you use to do the deployment. So one of the goals, of, I think, of, of the developing infrastructure is to create, a, is to create an open access platform that could actually be very cost effectively delivered to locations. So some some ballpark figure um, and, and, and some ballpark figure of what is the impact on public health. So, so say the, for example life expectancy. So I think the idea would be actually to, to improve the outcome. So it may not necessarily be immediately longer life expectancy, but would be in longer years, disease in ten, free periods. Say in, in ten years time, say so the idea would be is to reduce the morbidity associated with, in this instance, cancer, uh, by significant fractions of. of I mean, some some ballpark figure. No, what do you mean by significant? It's five percent, ten percent. Well, so point zero again, one I'll give a particular example of modern interventions that are happening right now with respect to previously untreatable cancers 
in the United States with the implementation of immunotherapy, there's a 25 to 30% uh, cure rate associated with literally incurable cancer before. So in this instance, it's not 100%, but you now actually would transform something that would have been a death sentence for individuals uh, within three to five years, now actually are having 10 to 20 years durable, durable response with respect to this intervention. So I would actually argue we would shoot for goals similar to this, uh, that we would have dramatic improvements in the, in the overall delivery of care and the reduction of morbidity. Good, thank you. Uh, uh, there, are, there are multiple things. One is that um, we have, a, as a country, India, we have a limited resources. Mm -hmm. We cannot spend that much in for every incurable cancer and try to ex extend the lifestyle or life expectancy for another two or three years or something like that. In, in some cases, it, some of these cancer drugs, they even say that they, the life expectancy is increased by a couple of months, not more than that. It's a huge. In that way, exactly what is the right issue on which uh, public health money should be spent. Yes. That is so, so my bias in this is actually through the more <coughs> evidence-based delivery of care that's delivered Where? To, Where? to, tailored yeah. to the Indian population, uh, not through the delivery of expensive mm -hmm. ne next generation interventions mm -hmm. like immunotherapy, but actually through the appropriate presentation of, of care to the existing population based on those characteristics, you would find comparable improvements uh, by making sure that you're delivering the care to the right people used up based on the, in, based on the infrastructure. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Professor Bhutto, I'm from a university in Delhi, but I'll ask specific questions. The first is that, uh, are we structuring data from the physician too much? Let me explain this a little bit. See, the concern is that the doctor or the physician, when you give a report in, gives it in an unstructured format. And by forcing them to choose from drop downs or radio buttons, the way that we tag our taxi drivers, for instance, we may be losing out on information. So your comments on that. Uh, the second, uh, should I ask three questions, right? Sure. The second is on blockchain. Are we far upstream in just a, pr a proposal, or is it actually in place so that you can distribute data? I say this because data is not easily distributed because of the two concerns you said, privacy and uh, other security, security aspects. Security. <laughs> but, so how far down the line are we in actually implementing it? And the third is we'd like access to the data so <laughs> to get it in place so that we can get it. I say this because India, uh, we've gone through these phases. Software over the last 15 years was a problem. It no longer is. It's free software is available, and so is the hardware as CDEC has put in place. But uh, data is a serious problem in any analysis, and uh, it's being held out in many ways, not using the bogey of privacy, I would say. Thank you. <coughs> so, so to answer the first question, I, I would actually argue you want a mix of both structured information and unstructured information. And the modern machine learning algorithms if doctors use their trained vocabulary, actually can find the patterns appropriate and extract the data out of unstructured clinical nodes, as well as the specific diagnostic codes. So I think you want coded information where coded information <coughs> exists, for, in particular in diagnostic <coughs> codes and other things that are used already today in reporting cancer and registries and other formats. Uh, and then uh, you want the capacity to capture the specific drugs interventions uh, against existing coding frameworks. But the specific encounters with the patients, I think you want to leave the doctor to have the capacity to put in what they did, not what the menu say they should have done or could have done. Uh, with respect to blockchain, blockchain has not. Blockchain is actually an increasingly robust, mature technology. Uh, and in fact, we're working with people who are, work, or who are attempting to put it into the health context. It has not yet been robustly used in the, in the health context. But I think what we need is pioneers that are interested in exploring its implementation in their institutions. And then I'm forgetting the third question. That's, that's the third <laughs> question is to give us a prescription on how to access the Thanks. data. Yeah, and, and I think is. the idea is, is by groups that are comfortable with both this new framework for generation and would leverage these new public ledger frameworks for sharing data, 
uh, you start to build an ecosystem of people who are sharing data. You, it's going to take pioneers who are interested in doing things a different way. Mm. Yes. Yes, Dr. Uh, Professor, uh, with non-existent EMR usage uh, in the country, and uh, you know, if you look at the uh, organized health sector, the patient pressure is so much that the doctors would say they have no time. You look at the unorganized sector, and they have no incentives. And without any government incentives, you know, coming forward, uh, what hope do we really have in gathering data and? and seeing some of this, uh, you know, nice stuff actually getting realized in a foreseeable future? Well, I think that the core question is, what's the value proposition to the care delivery system? And actually, an argument could be made that the delta in delivering more effective care or less ineffective care is, is where the resource comes from to ultimately support this. It would probably take some investment from government and or private sector or philanthropic sectors to begin the generation of that value loop. But I think uh, one of the attractive things that conceivably could be done in India is, is unlike where we have in the US where we have doctors entering this information, uh, in general you could actually have other people facilitating the actual physical entry of the information into systems. Uh, it, in fact, the, my students at Arizona State University actually are the ones quite commonly shadowing the doctors in the U.S. healthcare system and are the ones that are actually doing the data entry, it's not the doctors themselves nowadays for many of these electronic health systems. There's a, an additional collection of people that are now being used to help facilitate that entry. But, but I think it's going to take a mix of incentives uh, as well as benefits to the physicians, and I, I recognize exactly what you're saying, that the physician load is already very high, but then if there's features that their burdens are reduced in other ways and are supported through these systems, then I think there, there actually becomes value in it for the physicians to use them. Yeah, up here in front, please. Thank you very much for not only lucid, but also uh, utopian if I may say so, framework. I represent the National Institute of Cancer Prevention from the Indian Council of Medical Research. So basically what you're saying is music to my ears to a certain extent. However, the three things which I'm sure you are already aware, and my colleagues here who work in India, uh, first of all, is there a political will? Is there, I'm a physician, is there a will from, as a physician, as you already mentioned, what is the value proposition? And thirdly, uh, what Andrew talked about was giving access to my data. All of us are very possessive of our data, and unfortunately there are even earlier days used to be ledgers, but now there are hard disks full of data which we quite often don't even utilize. So it seems like a utopian idea at the present moment. Uh, if we have Google, you have WhatsApp, you have Facebook, and so on and so forth of the world, they are able to use it primarily because that is a business model. And again, to repeat what, I, what you just mentioned, where do you see how, in addition to delivering better health care, in addition to analyzing what we have, and also improving the quality of life, which is the end result of what we are trying to about, and not only years, but also adding life to those years that you have. Do you and the panel uh, at the dais see it happening in the next five, maybe 10 years? It has not happened in most of the developed countries in the world. And of course, if anything we start, we all have advantages which you just enumerated, which I need not go into. But, and with the great push of getting electronic, getting digital, which we have in the country, do you see it happening in the next five to 10 years, provided all of the bits and pieces start working together? So I would argue that almost every system that starts out uh, looks utopian before it's in place. Uh, I can recall in my youth the thought that every book could be accessible by sitting down at a website and actually finding it seemed like an idea that was out of science fiction. But I can do that today uh, because of, as you said, the, the value proposition that emerged in having business models that underpin this. What I would actually argue is where there's multiple answers to your questions, not a single one. One 
answer to the question is that through the delivery of better care, the argument is it'll be more cost effectively delivered. So in this instance, we won't waste intervention in, context, in circumstances where it doesn't work. We won't have to cite, we will get better, better at decision making, so value will be produced in true hard currency costs by not delivering care where it is not efficacious and having to cycle through to discover what's efficacious. So one of the places that the business model produces it is in that space. The other place it produces it is actually in the actual generation of new therapeutic approaches. So they're just the same as, uh, again, uh, you're probably aware that Apple has stepped into this space in a very big way with respect to its health kit framework. So it actually sees there being value that Apple itself, the world's <coughs> largest company, actually is investing in the healthcare market right now because it thinks it will be able to find a business model for selling these frameworks in a manner that support consumer care and actually people will be willing to pay to actually have access to this class of information. So I would actually argue that part of that paying for comes a little bit out of the patient who actually already today is paying for health care delivery. But so part of that payment will come through the current reimbursement systems. But some of the payment will also then come from government incentives and other places where the overall cost of care will be reduced by a more effective and efficient means by which it's being delivered. Uh, thank you so much. Um, if I may just give a very brief analogy. Uh, in India, we were using our manual typewriters, Remington Rand, and so on and so forth for ages. And then there came an era of electronic typewriters, which we never really embraced in this country. There hardly anybody used electronic typewriter. And finally, we moved to the keyboard and the computer. So again, this is uh, probably fantasy. But the way I'm looking at it, why not wait for Windows to come up, for Microsoft or Apple to come up with healthcare, and then jump onto it rather than go through the whole painful process? I mean, let the delivery be painless. Of course, it doesn't happen. We, we do have a lot of uh, computing power here, and probably we'd probably be somewhere in between, have a hybrid approach that let's not rush into something, as you rightly said. We, we are not into electronic health record. There is a strong push from the government for the last so many years, probably decades, and it's probably going to come in as it's come in everywhere else in the world. But rather than rushing in, let's go one step at a time. Let's get our in internal issues sorted out and hope and pray that in the next five years it happens. It's really more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think the last question from back there. Thank you for the presentation, sir. Uh, just out of curiosity, just uh, wanted to understand, uh, you must have shared this model with pharma companies. I would just like to know what their reaction is like. Uh, do they support it or they uh, kind of somehow try to brush it away or just your comment on how pharma industry react to this? So the pharma industry is actually in, in the midst of a huge revolution as to how to actually deal with the care delivery. One of the huge problems that pharma has faced right now is adherence to the actual prescribing models and actually both the physician and patient care associated with the use of, the, of, of their agents. So in fact, what pharma is doing now is literally creating monitoring systems that can be put in place to help facilitate the actual measurement of whether, whether their drugs are being administered uh, appropriately by physicians, as well as whether consumers are using them as prescribed. So there's, a, there's actually a surprising mounting interest from the pharmaceutical industry because they're worried about as these new regulations come into place as to uh, comparative effectiveness and whether which drug should be used in what circumstance, in particular in Europe and what's emerging in the United States. They care a lot about the, having the evidence base that actually indicates that their drug should be reimbursed uh, as opposed to somebody else's drug. So they're actually starting to step into this space. And actually is again another one of these players that would actually help provide incentives to the system uh, to help facilitate the generation of this evidence. Thank you, Ken. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Bhatkar for his comments and his views.
First, I really would like to thank Anil for inviting me, or inviting all of us for this great lecture. And it, I think what Kane, I think you really, your lecture has been very fulfilling to, all, to many of us here. Fulfilling, satisfying, inspiring, so many things. And thanks for really instituting this lecture series, which will throw light on many questions. Yesterday evening, we were really traveling from Pune to Delhi, not for this lecture, I was going for something else. And then we were discussing uh, Rajendra, Dr. Rajendra Joshi, who has been my colleague since the inception of CDAC itself, and since we started working in bioinformatics. And um, we were sitting side by side, and I said, this is a thing that we hardly sit together. It's a time to really discuss some very critical issues. See, CDAC has launched, like many other countries, a major initiative in high-performance computing, supercomputing. There's a national initiative. that's called National Supercomputing Mission. And the mission is to really create next generation supercomputers. I told him that you may not believe himself as a part of the team, but I think we are on the verge of really creating what we are set out for. And that goal has been, the mission has been to create next generation, next generation supercomputers which can perform exascale, exascale machines. And it's a big challenge really to develop that. The computing power or the supercomputing power has been increasing a factor of 1000 every decade. I, every decade. We have been seeing this from, from the 90s, ever since we launched the first program. So now we are working on the, 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 the challenge that we had taken when CDAC was launched was to generate, I think, the machines which can perform billion operations per second. And then I think we did, did that. And the next challenge came for a, go, going on to trillion. And the next challenge, challenge now is to going to Petyad, which is now the kind of supercomputers we perform, which, which, which we have. And the next challenge is to build this exascale machine. The 10 to the power 18 mathematical operations, say, flops, mathematical operations per second. And this is a non-trivial issue, really. This one, it may involve totally new architectures as well. And I told him that we have an architecture which we will actually do, try to do, actually fulfill. Of course, the US has been trying to do that. China is trying. The whole Europe is trying. And we are also trying to do that. And there is a national supercomputing mission in place. Why I'm saying this is the factor is that so we have the architecture and we can build the machine. And the government has provided for 4,500 crores. Actually, deliver only 450 in the middle of the mission. And that, that's a challenge which I faced in the first mission also, this one. And, and this, this thing, you may define a mission, but actually uh, entirely different things will happen. And anyway, so we are facing that challenge. But suppose we develop, suppose we build, and we are going to build these exascale machines. What shall we do? What, what are we going to do with it? That is the question Modi ji is going to ask. What we, it would matter, and we should ask send to, a, to a common man, to India's healthcare system, or anything else, which is, which is a great challenging thing in the context of the, the great population of this country. So and the question he came, and the answer he came that, Say, you are working in bioinformatics, you are the BRAF, what, you are, what Kane, Professor Kane described, we have this one. So what change it will occur? What will occur through this mission delivery? He said this question can be answered by one person, and that person is going to be Professor Kane. You attend his lecture, and you will find the answer to that question. I think I must confess before you, I think I found that answer in Kane's lecture, which I have been struggling to really see it myself. It is amazing that I think can acknowledge, I think the India, we always ask, we have been following the US, we have been following the West, when, which is the fields really, we, we can really, really catapult ourselves. Can we not lead anything? And I said, which field we have led, really? And the answer comes is the information technology. I think, I think, um, 
Dr. Kiran Karnik is there. He has contributed to that, the whole thing like that kind of thing. We never believed. We, we didn't know the word information technology. In 91, the IT word was not there. And I remember in CDAC, of course, we were computing and all that thing. And this word came from informatics. And then we, the science, and we started learning what information technology means. Thanks God, the Y2K, that opportunity came. And I say that we are going to address, and it's going to be unique uh, opportunity for India to get into that. But the question was, this will require thousands and thousands of professionals, I think the question which was, thousands and thousands of professionals going to requ require to really address the Y2K challenge in that time, which is the slot which is available to us. So, and we really, in, within CDAC, I, I saw that we, we can train people, people who have never understood even the scientific computing at, at all, and, and, and the new languages can be, can be developed, can be created, and we can, we can answer that by creating the professional. The answer which was there, that there were no computing professionals at that time of that order at all in the country. And we thought that only electronics engineers or uh, computer in engineers can become the software professionals. And we questioned that, that very premise. And what happened was that we could teach anybody. We, we developed a program, I think, which civil engineers, mechanical, chemical, anyone could be taught in six months, a rigorous program, I think, and, and, and we created professionals. The end result has been that we, we have created an industry which we can never imagine, which at that time now we have projected the thing, $150 billion and more, and $200 billion. 10% of the economy, national economy is coming from that. I think what I was, what I was trying to say, what we never imagined was really solved. Now, I think Professor Kane, you are proposing to us that we can create Next generation healthcare, not only the burden of the current, current uh, thing why healthcare India has got and we don't know how to solve, but we can create a next generation system and show the world the way. I think that is the proposition which you are making, which is very inspiring and I believe that. I think that, that is, the, I think this lecture is, I think, given that, 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 that direction to us, looking healthcare entirely different way and that's what the innovation is about, what you, what you talked about. So I feel that, I personally feel that the problem, and I think we have been addressing, thanks to again uh, Anil, we have been addressing the problem of cancer. I think we are thinking, the, can we change next generation technology? And this can be a collaboration work. It's not, be, I think we have been addressing that this, now these are world problems, and then world must collaborate together. Nations must collaborate together to really solve them in different ways. I think that's what the, I think the message of today's lecture has been, and it has really inspired me. I think. The tech, again, I want to address here in front of Dr. Kiran Karani. The question was that, okay, we created a software revolution, but how about the hardware? Now, this challenge today, the supercomputing, I think has been that I think we have to develop and deliver this machine from the chip level, not in terms of manufacturing, but, but in terms of design, can we develop the next generation chips also? And that's what the, I think the, this, uh, this whole mission is also trying to address. So we can so do something very thing which we have never done before. I think, and also the I think the challenge of cancer itself we have discussed in many 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 ways. If this is tra transferred as a data science problem, the big data issues, artificial intelligence issues, and ad addressing the healthcare from that perspective, I think we can do something which we have never done before. So I think your lecture has inspired us to do that. I can see that we can address and we can collaborate with you. I think this morning we decided that. You guide, I think it's another thing. Yes, great guru. I think you have been in the, you have, been, you have appreciated this problem and how do you translate that problem? And we are all looking at it. I think in, in involving scientists from NIS, involving scientists from NIH here, and involving people like CDAG and many other labs which we have got collaborating together, we, I think, will be really able to address some of the, uh, I think, unsolvable problems as we see today. The next thing, another thing which we discussed was, why not we look at integrative healthcare? And that, that problem which is looking at, why not look at, I think, synthesizing, not synthesizing, but networking Ayurveda, or the ancient uh, um, healthcare systems with the modern healthcare systems together. And what are the challenges before that? And many new problems will, many new challenges will arise. Let's look at that way as well. And we are looking at it. I think NIH has accepted. I think uh, the, the new uh, the working group uh, which OHSL has formed, Anil has formed, we are, we are looking at that as well. So looking at these problems 
globally in a very innovative way, looking at synthesizing the ancient knowledge along with the modern knowledge, we will be able to address I think, the new challenges before us. I am very inspired by the lecture, and I think yeah, you have shown the way, and we'll work together and to address some of these great challenges before humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhatkar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the program. I want to thank each one of you for listening patiently, for being very active listeners. Those of you who ask questions, thank you for those. And those who have other questions, maybe Ken is here for a few moments, you can address theirs to him. And of course, a special word to Anil Srivastava and Dint acknowledge earlier, a dear friend from old times, for putting this whole thing together. The first of our series, as he's promised, and now not only have you said it and Konika has said it, but Dr. Bhatkar has also said first of a series. So you've got to keep it going. Let me hand over to Konika to close the event. Okay, as we come to the end of this uh, evening, I would like to thank our panelists. I would, I would say we are particularly indebted to Dr. Ken Butro for coming all the way from the US. Uh, in, I mean, we know what a busy schedule he does have, but more than that, he has been really instrumental in shaping the principle behind the way OHSL works. So it's about sharing of knowledge, of getting knowledge together and working together in a collaboration. And uh, so we are very happy that uh, Dr. Butro was the first speaker in our series. We're also very grateful to Dr. Bhatkar. He has come all the way from Pune. He has been, as I said earlier, the guiding spirit behind a lot of our uh, collaborations, particularly the Indo-US uh, Advanced Radiotherapy Consortium, the Ayurved Developmental Therapeutics Program, and he continues to uh, guide us, uh, given his vast uh, experience in the computational sciences field. Uh, Mr. Kiran Karnik, also we are very, very grateful for uh, coming and chairing the session. And uh, again, with his vast experience of information technology, we will continue to discuss with him and hope he will continue to take us forward in uh, integrating information technology in our, uh, in our uh, research. So thank you very much. And I think Dr. Bhatkar really uh, put it the, there, that it is really collaboration coming together of different institutions together rather than working separately. I mean, it's a much faster way to get to our goals. I'd also like to thank uh, the India International Center. Uh, it were, we were, uh, we are, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Srivastav, the director of IIC, could not be here today. He is not in Delhi, but he um, received this proposal with great enthusiasm and was very encouraging right from the start. And I'd uh, thank the program division, uh, Ms. Premala Ghosh, Ms. Tos Chang, uh, uh, Indrani uh, Majumdar. They were very, very helpful in taking this uh, forward. All the staff of IIC who make this a very smooth uh, uh, presentation and evening. So I'm very thankful to the IIC staff for doing this. So, and Last but not the least, there was a glitch, but the banners are ready last minute. Because, uh, so I'm very thankful to Anklan Software and um, Shanti Arts because last minute they jumped to it and got it ready so we could have it up. So thank you. And well, last but not the least, the audience, I'm very, very happy you took out time to come and uh, attend this talk. And I'm sure you would have found it a very uh, Fascinating, instructive, and inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you.